welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. I'm here today with Mia Barron, the front woman of the American indie rock grunge band from Brooklyn, Pom Pom Squad. The group with Shelby Keller, drums, and Alex Mercury, guitar, cut their teeth playing packed Brooklyn apartments, but they quickly graduated to packed Brooklyn venues alongside artists like Soccer Mommy, Adult Mom, and Pronoun. The band's latest album is Death of a Cheerleader. We're really happy to have her on and talk to her today. Also, Mia, so welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Mia, I'm just curious to hear how you would describe the stressors of the music industry. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I can absolutely relate to that. Um, I've been a full-time musician for the past I'd say two and a half years, uh, which has been a huge lifestyle change. Before that, I was a student and I was doing day jobs. Um, and, you know, working retail requires different skill sets than working in the music industry. Uh, in terms of the music industry, I quit my day job to go on tour. And most of my job since then has been touring. I'm back home right now for the first time. Uh, it's the longest consecutive amount of time I've been home in two years, which has been three months. Um, but for me, being bipolar, something like getting sleep is really important. Um, taking my medication at the same time, uh, you know, making sure I'm eating properly, making sure that I'm uh, drinking enough water, just doing all of the things that your body baseline needs in general, but also that your body needs as a baseline to maintain your mental stability and keep you seeing clearly. The way that the touring industry works, it's just not conducive to anyone's physical health, really. There's, uh, you know, money's tight. Um, sleep is few and far between. Uh, food, the options for food are usually not great. Uh, you're not very active during the day. You're usually on a long drive. You know, for me, because I'm still a smaller artist, we're usually touring in vans versus sometimes we're chasing after an artist who's touring on a bus. And while those artists can sleep on the bus and they have a driver um, and they can get to the venue early and have a little bit more time to relax just for the sake of saving money, honestly, it's just not realistic for us to expect to do something like sleep through the night while we're on a tour. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, one thing I'm also curious about is those stressors that you describe and their effects on physical and mental health. Is that different from how the music itself affects you, from how um, like performing affects you? And if so, uh, how would you describe it? What does music, your music, performing with your band do for you? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm thinking about a specific tour we went on. We did a a headline tour last year, uh, around exactly a year ago, um, where I was just having a really difficult time mentally. The be behind the scenes of that tour was really difficult for me, uh, but the show has really kept me going. I think doing a headline is different than doing any other kind of tour, because at least for me and in my experience, I would get to go out every night and see people who loved my music and were familiar with me and familiar with my songs and they were singing my songs back to me and it gave me a completely new perspective on the music that I had made because when I'm writing I'm usually writing for me I think people people I've been hearing this phrase a lot because I'm writing my second record right now but uh I've heard people say you have your whole life to write your first record and you have a year to write your second um for me, those songs have been a culmination of many years of my life and, and many different places that I've been uh, as a growing person. And meeting people who had similar experiences to me or completely dissimilar experiences to me who loved the songs and had some moment from their own lives that uh, they could tie into the music was really mind-blowing and so special. and that really kept me going. I think the 
the love of the music and the love of what I do is kind of the only reason that I can continue to to do this, you know, because it is a job. You know, if I if I just wanted to put out music and, you know, throw it up on Bandcamp and say, that's it, that could be a way to live my life. And that would be, you know, just for the love of doing it. But like, I, I want this to be my career and I want to take it as far as I can go. And that's just where I'm at as an artist. Um, but that also means that I have to be prepared for the stressors, as we were talking about, that come with making this a, a career. And I think every time I question that decision of whether or not I should have just thrown it up on Bandcamp and gone back to working retail, um, seeing the people in the audience react to my music and hearing from those people is what r reminds me to keep going. That must be so affirming. Yeah, it's it's really special. And I think it's it's kind of the cliche answer that you hear every musician say is like, it's it's so unreal when you hear people singing back to you. But it really is. I mean, it, it, it you know, for me as somebody who is generally pretty introverted and um, not the most like social butterfly in the room, um, I found it very hard to connect with people growing up. And, you know, even now I have a very small circle of of people that I let into my life. And so it feels really good and very affirming that my thoughts can connect people to me, even when I don't always feel like I can connect with people, you know, one-to-one. -one. Being open in the music industry um, as someone with a diagnosis, um, uh, like bipolar, um, how do you find that? I mean, um, it, we just talked about sort of stressors in the music industry. So you're you're being both open in the music industry itself as like a as like an industry of you know music making, and then you're also being open with your fans and and just the general public. Which you know it's 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 um, you know overcoming uh, the stigma of difference of any kind is so hard in just everybody's day-to-day -day life. But when you're just this larger personality with a larger following and you're just like, hey, it's kind of like me with voice hearing. It's like you just, you have this way of just uh, putting it out there. And what are the consequences? I mean, I can, you know, I have plenty of consequences in my life of saying, you know, openly in public in different ways that I'm a voice hearer and I, I'm a visions and voices person, you know, and, um, so what is that like for you? What are the benefits? What are the consequences? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the bigger consequences I th of being a public person in general is being exposed to a lot more opinions that any human being should naturally be exposed to. Oh my God. I just have to say that's like, yeah, I can, I can, I, I can't and can imagine, but because just people in general, but man, you must get it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think every person who starts putting things out publicly is thinking, even if they think they're thinking publicly is thinking very locally, um, localized inside your own mind, localized to your own community. Um, you know, so I would say something that I thought would be completely non-controversial, whether that was, you know, something political, whether that was something, you know, surrounding my mental health that I was like, yeah, everybody knows and agrees with this because this is the normal way to think, quote unquote. And then suddenly you're exposed to the fact that the Internet is a lawless county with no borders and um anyone can find your stuff. I think I was talking about the um, the TikTok algorithm. I promise this is relevant. Um, and how TikTok comments are a lot meaner than normal comments. And my, the reason, I believe, this is my unified theory of TikTok, is that um, TikTok comments are a lot meaner because the algorithm is servicing you to people who they think will like your stuff based on things that they 
have watched in the past, but who are not necessarily looking for you. So I could say, you know, oh, I had this experience on uh, on my tour, you know, expecting the people who follow me are my fans. They're going to react and then get a comment like, wow, they'll verify anyone these days. You know, it's sort of like you're not prepared for that kind of a comment because you're only thinking, you know, the people that I expect to see this will see this. And you're speaking to your audience. You're speaking to your localized part of the community. Um, and I think when you're first exposed to that, it's very shocking uh, and very jarring. And for me, I, it made me want to just stop showing my personality altogether outside of my music. And I went through a period of time where, um, if I was not releasing music, it's like, I only wanted to just post pictures of like what I was wearing, where I was, you know, I didn't want to talk about what I was feeling. I didn't want to talk about what I was thinking because once you reach a level of vulnerability um, with the internet in that way, it's like you're allowing people to love you for who you are, but you're also allowing people to hate you for who you are. Does does this uh, like does it translate to with um uh, with the the mental health stuff? Like, the, the, is there specific vitriol that comes, or a vitriol or the opposite, the the positive consequences of connection and and support around you know the the sort of um openness around that yeah i mean to be honest i haven't talked a ton about my bipolar publicly yet so i haven't really gotten the 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 opportunity to receive that uh criticism just yet um i mean i think the the thing that has been difficult for something that i can think of particularly as it pertains to mental health is when my music came out i got a lot of reviews that were like oh you're it's it's melodramatic it's moody it's so angsty it's so you know over the top all of these feelings that she's expressing which is what makes it awesome by the way <laughs> <laughs> well thank you but you know also i think it, the idea of melodrama and to have like my feelings be called melodramatic it's reductive i think it's reductive as one somebody with a mood disorder and two as a young woman um, because, you know, we've been hearing since the dawn of time, this idea of like women and hysteria and, uh, you're being overdramatic. What I love about your music is your songs are really crunchy and catchy. They're tuneful, they're hard, the lyrics are so vivid and they're blunt and they're emotionally searing and they're often heavy. And in fact, that's actually one of your songs. It's, it's like called heavy, heavy, and it grapples with depression. And so I was listening to this and it's like you're owning everything. You're putting it out there. And when you brought up hysteria, for me, that's one of the great examples. Like, well, great, not in the sense of being wonderful, but great in the sense of being a vivid example of women being told, being shouted down by the patriarchy saying, oh, are you expressing yourself? Are you empowering yourself? Are you telling the men in the room that what you think and who you are? Oh, then you're being melodramatic. You're hysterical. And so what you seem to be doing with your music is you're saying, okay, this is me. I'm putting this out there and I'm owning it and I'm empowered. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that how you would describe it? No, I mean, that that's totally fair. Um yeah, I think uh, I'm putting it out there in the way that I am because it's like, it's all I have, you know, like that's the experience that I can speak to. And those are the states that inspired me to write music in the first place. Um, you know, people always ask me about Pom Pom Squad and the cheer, the whole cheerleader thing. Um, and it's a, it's a frustrating kind of, thing to address over and over and over not because it's not a valid question you know it's it's i think the cheerleader character is very polarizing in culture uh and i initially adopted that character and and named the band the way that i did because the cheerleader always felt like the archetype of the of the quote-unquote good woman to me or good girl um 
you know, what you're supposed to be as a young woman. And, you know, I started writing music when I was 16. So I was still in high school and I was struggling with the fact that I didn't look like the girls that I saw on TV as being like valuable, societally valuable girls. Um, you know, I, I'm, I am not a white woman. Uh, you know, I'm not straight. Uh, you know, I wasn't conventional in the beauty standards of, of whiteness. Um, when I was growing up particularly and, um, I was angry and I was frustrated and I didn't, I didn't really see a place for myself in the world, uh, in society because there were no, there was nobody that I could look to that modeled a career that seemed feasible to me or realistic. Um, I, my mom and I really loved listening to music together and going to shows together. And that was like, uh, when I was really struggling with my mental health in high school, that was something that she did for me that changed my life was taking me to shows and allowing me to, you know, if I got all my homework done on a school night, we would like go out to the house of blues in my hometown, or we would go out to these like little dive bars in my hometown. And I would just, it was like a, a study for what I do now. Um, I just learned so much about performance by watching shows with her and I think she loved the Smiths and the Cure and like alt music um, and my dad really loved hip-hop and uh, R&B and I think you kind of reach that age where you you know you start with your parents music and then you sort of find what your niche is and when I found out about Riot Girl and grunge that was um, the game changer yeah that was going to be my next question around, like, I really do want to hear more about y your presence and identity, uh, you know, as a person of color in the music industry, who is also out as a person with a diagnosis. How is this affecting your your career? Yeah. I think sort of as it pertains to my experience in the music industry and the music that I write, you know, my music is queer because I'm queer. My music is inherently you know, related to the experience of being a person of color, because that's the only perspective that I have been given. And it's a perspective that I, I feel grateful to have. Um, because I'm proud of who I am. And it's taken me a long time to, you know, be able to say that um, and stop, you know, seeing that as a, as a, as a detriment and start seeing it as an asset, because I'm, you know, I'm proud that I get to have different perspectives to maybe the mainstream. Um, but, uh, you know, that said, it definitely impacts how I feel that I have to conduct myself around people. Um, I think we've all heard at this point, certain stereotypes about people of color and, you know, how they're allowed to experience anger or how they're, you know, allowed to experience rage. Um, I mean, I think without kind of, you know, blowing up any individual person's spot. You know, there's members of my family who have darker skin than me and who have been deprived of really critical, important diagnoses because they were being told, you know, oh, you have, you're having a panic attack when they actually had a heart condition, you know? It's an added layer to like the already sort of handshakey secret code E world of, the music industry you have to conduct yourself a certain way you have to talk you know to people a certain way you have to talk about yourself a certain way to also add that you know for me um an example that i always use is when i will go to a venue you know pom pom squad is my project and you know i've had uh permanent band members for the past five years who will continue to be my permanent band members and who i feel so lucky to have in my life but, you know, at the end of the day, it is my band and the one white cis man in the band would always get asked, like, what does she want in her monitor? How, how does she want her guitar mixed? And, you know, at the end of the day, it's me who's standing at the front of the stage and uh, who's making the calls. And um, in my personal experience, when I knew I wanted to get serious about music, I decided to transfer to 
music school to learn about audio engineering and music production because I knew, and business, because I knew that if I didn't, that I was going to be talked down to and that I was more likely to be taken advantage of. And it's the best decision I've ever made for myself because I have seen those contracts that I've been scared of. And I have been in those situations where someone tried to tell me like, oh, well, we, we fixed that with your monitor. And I, you know, and I can say like, no, you didn't because I have ears and I can hear it. And I, you know, I know what to listen for. Well, so I'm wondering what was the moment where you decided, oh, okay, okay. I'm not just going to do this for myself as a hobby. I'm going to make a career out of this. What led you to that moment? And was part of it, oh, I have to say something. I have to express something. I have to put my voice out there in a way that people can hear. I mean, what led you to that? Yeah, um, that's a great question and also definitely pertains to my mental health. Um, So up until my sophomore year of college, so I grew up, you know, I grew up singing Um, and I started playing guitar when I was 14, but there was just something in me that never connected the dots that you could start a band or you could, you know, I could make music myself. Um, so I was really focused for all of high school on being an actor. Uh, I love films and I love visuals and that's a huge part of my artistic identity. And so at the time that manifested as me wanting to pursue acting. And so when I initially got into NYU, it was to be in the acting program. And I was there for two years. Um, And it took such a a toll on me mentally. Uh, That was around the time that I started to notice that there was something wrong, quote unquote, wrong with me beyond just depression and anxiety. I would have panic attacks during classes. Um, I would just start crying out of nowhere. I would get irrationally angry. Um, and I was told basically, you know, and I would, I was falling behind because I was struggling and how can you, you know, do something as physical and as mentally taxing as acting when you're not, when you are not feeling whole. Um, that was my experience with it at least. And, and I, I would fall behind and I basically got, got told, you know, there are no bad classes, only bad actors, which just made me shut down more and, and retreat into myself. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah, it was. And, you know, I, I, I heard a lot of really ugly things from, from acting teachers about myself. You know, I, I remember a teacher told me like, well, you know, they basically implied that like there was like a sort of semester meeting where they told you they took everyone into a room and they said, you know, here's what you're going to be typecast as. Here's what you're excelling at. Here's what you're, you know, not as good at. And all the girls came out of their meetings like he told me that I'm beautiful and I'm a leading lady and, you know, I'm really good at X, Y and Z and I'll be great for these kinds of movies. And I went into my meeting and he he basically implied that I'm not pretty enough to act and then was like but you'll probably do relatively well as an actress of color yeah are you kidding me oh my god (laughs) just your story just reminds me of how little we understand uh difference and and allow for difference and allow for different pacing and like different bodies different everything like we're just so close-minded around here is the path If you can't walk it, you're nobody and you can't get anywhere, right? Like, and you're just, and I hate that. It's just like, where is um, the uh, understanding that uh, of of diversity and difference um, in the, at least like you're talking about in the schooling environment, it's just, it creates these situations where people do fall behind and blame themselves and... Yeah, it was really appalling. And, and, you know, there was also this kind of group mentality in that where I, you know, I would see people fall behind and, you know, peers, the people around me and me included because I was influenced by the people around me. It was like you were the joke if you were the one who was falling behind in the class, you know, and you were getting in everyone else's way. And then I became that person, you know, essentially things with my mental health just got to a really 
bad place. Um, and I start, I was doing, you know, short films for students at the time. And I really enjoyed doing short films and, and meeting other film students and kind of seeing their processes. And while I was working on a short film, I met some, some guys at NYU who were studying music technology and they started, you know, talking about building amps and all the things they do and how they're recording stuff. And, um, I don't know. There are these moments in my life where I just adopt this kind of bravado that I don't really even understand where it comes from. I think part of it is ego and part of it is aspiration. And I basically lied and I was like, oh, I have a band and I make music and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, oh, really? And I was like, yep, my band's called Pom Pom Squad. And I, I made up this whole thing. I don't know. It was like just a moment of ambition. And, you know, I'd started writing music in my bedroom when I was 16. And so suddenly these guys were like, oh, well, we want to hear your music. And so I had to like pull out these demos that I made when I was a teenager. And then I lied and I said I was working on an EP. And so then I had to go write an EP. Um, but basically how that eventually became a music, how, you know, how it became like my career and what I wanted to do was that I'd been working with these guys and, um, you know, I, I, this was, that was kind of my introduction to music production as a concept as I was trying to kind of work out parts with them for music that I wrote and mix these songs. Um, and I would try to express an idea, you know, because I've listened to a lot of music in my life. I've always been a music fan first and foremost. And I just, I didn't have the language to express what I wanted. And, uh, there's one day where we finished a song and I kind of, sat back and let them take the reins on something in a way that I didn't feel comfortable with. And a couple months later, I listened back to the song and I was like, I just don't like it. I, I don't feel comfortable to release it. And I went to them and I said, Hey, I really, I, I don't know. I don't feel good about this. It's just off to me. I want to start it over. And they basically were like, you're being, you're being crazy. Like you should just chill. It's like not a big deal. Uh, and I sort of let them like mollify me and, and I, I was like, okay. And I left the room and as I was walking out of the room, I heard them all laugh at me. And that's when I decided I was like, I need to learn how to produce music. Cause I just never want to feel this again. I'm sorry for all you went through, but in a way that story, your origin story of Pom Pom Squad and how you came to this moment when you realized, I have to own this. To me, that is the embodiment of that kick-ass cheerleader persona that you took on. And I love that piece of it. You're saying, I'm going to take this image of femininity that is just so stereotyped and it has so many negative associations with weakness. And like, in that moment, you became that kick-ass cheerleader. And so I'm wondering, was that freeing for you? I'm just curious if there's something also about the process of writing and making music, whether it helps you maybe understand yourself and then express yourself like in a new way. Definitely. I think the goal of my music first and foremost will always be to understand myself better. And I think when I've written with anything other than that goal, I have not succeeded in, in creating the kind of work that I want to create. Because I've written two EPs. My second EP is is the one that I had the biggest hand in uh, production-wise of the, of the two that I put out. And so I consider that my first EP. Uh, so my first EP, Ow, was really about my diagnosis with bipolar and, and struggling with my mental health and, and learning a lot about myself during that time. I wrote it when I was maybe 20, 21. Uh, so very, very early into these discoveries and, and um, it truly did help me find the language to understand my own brain better and to communicate my feelings better. Um, and with Death of a Cheerleader, that album was dedicated to my journey with my queerness and, and coming out and um, understanding these feminine archetypes that I had held myself to in my own life that held me back from being a full formed human being. Uh, and so but all of the projects that I've, I've done have had 
a huge relation to where I was mentally and, and um, with myself. I really uh, resonate with that sort of like process of a work of art, just kind of like moving something through you and out into the world in this prideful way around like something that we're supposed to be ashamed of and then sort of transforming that and letting that kind of churn and, and um, actually come out as, as this beautiful part of our wholeness. So I really, really resonate with that. And I think something I wanted to ask you since we're talking about kind of you were saying that you had this sort of experience with your first album where you were uh, churning, letting the music churn the bipolar um, diagnosis and, and how, how you were coming to terms with that and learning the language to speak about it and to, to understand it as a part of your wholeness. Um, I, I also, you know, had the bipolar diagnosis. I don't identify with it any longer, but for me it was um, very much... Um, uh, a dance of uh, trying to find uh, what was um, part of my creative uniqueness, the the um, the diversity of who I was, and then the other things that may or may not cause you know stress or or, or um, things that you know could be under the column of disease, and and parsing those two for me became you know twenty four seven like thing like where is my brain now is it is it diversity or disease. Um, is it creativity or disease? Um, so, so that became a real exhausting thing for me that I eventually just had to let go. And the way I sort of solved that for myself was just, I really did let go of the bipolar label altogether. Um, but I wonder what your experience with that as, as a musician, as this wonderfully talented, creative musician, you know, how you parse the, um, disease versus diversity, creativity versus disease sort of paradigm. Yeah, that's a great question, and I've never heard it put that way. So that, uh, that gives me a lot to think about as well. Um, when I was diagnosed, I was I was initially kind of confused because I had only ever heard people talk about bipolar as, you know, you're manic, you're having a great time, you think you can do everything, you're on top of the world, and you know you're depressed and you're low. And I experienced those uh, those lows, but I had never experienced the like manic, I can do anything highs. And so when I was told that I, I was bipolar, I was like, there's no way, you know, that doesn't make any sense. But the way that my bipolar manifests is depression, uh, you know, baseline, and then hypervigilance and really high extreme anxiety, uh, which I didn't understand they were related. And so my hypervigilance, I, I mean, I just really was kind of going through the world thinking that everything was going to hurt me, you know? Yeah, but I think for me the highs would uh would manifest a lot of the time as anger, really extreme anger. Um and you know, I could there were moments that I obviously wrote about that and wrote it out, but I think the the past couple of years I've had a really important realization about my mental health and I, this is something that I have sort of been on my soapbox about. Um I think that a lot of young artists are tied to this myth of you have to suffer for your art, um, which I think is actually a really harmful myth. For me, I think that, you know, I viewed like basically just putting myself in emotional pain as having the experiences I, I needed to be an artist. And so I would put myself in these situations that, you know, were almost like, oh, well, I know this is going to be a great story. You know, I would like put myself kind of in the line of fire, whether that was romantically, whether that was like just making dumb decisions, you know, putting myself in unsafe situations because I was like, well, if you want to be a real artist, you have to have experiences, you have to struggle, you have to suffer. Um, you know, and for me as a person with a diagnosis, uh, giving myself that sort of range of emotions was also like walking a very dangerous line with my mental health because following those highs and lows and getting really absorbed in the highs and lows is very dangerous for someone with bipolar disorder. I do want to speak to um, something you said earlier though, in terms of like craft and, you know, the idea that a musician embodies uh, what people in the general public are allowed to suppress because that, that's really real and um, so accurate but I, I've also been thinking about there's a, def, a really different relationship 
you know, and I'm sure you know this as an artist, it's like there's a really different relationship between the artist and their work and an audience and their work. And um, in terms of experiencing these altered states, something that I get up on stage and do, you know, for other people is embody something that they can't express themselves. But what I have to do as an artist to continue to have this job is I have to take what I felt in the altered state and craft it into something. And I think that especially around women who make music and who make art, there's the, the language of craft is often left out of the mix. Um, you know, I'll read a lot of articles about cis male artists where, you know, they'll be like, it was brilliantly crafted, inspired by events from her own life or from his own life. And then I'll read an, an, you know, an article, let's say a woman wrote the same album, you know, or a non cis man wrote the same album. And it's this like, she is a beautiful songstress, you know? And it's like, it's he makes versus she is. And it's this, this language around women. That's like, you either have it or you don't, you know, music is just this magical thing that happens to you. Um, but I think what I kind of want to, make very clear about myself and my artistry is, you know, in terms of the whole suffer for your art, you have to struggle for your art. I can make art or out of the altered states that I feel, but when I'm constantly living in these altered states in an effort to like make more content or make more art, that's not conducive to actually crafting because crafting is something that takes like work and effort and like sitting down at a desk and trying to like bang out, you know, a paragraph of writing into into three words, you know, to fit the right line. Um, and so I think it's like a, a piece of advice that I have for artists in general who who experience altered states um, through their own mental disorders is like taking care of yourself is the best thing that you could do for yourself as an artist, because that's what's going to help you make your best work. Like the suffering is just going to happen. Like the suffering and the struggling, like that's just life, but you don't have to like feed into that in order to make your best work. Your best work is going to be made when you can have clarity and perspective to be able to share those things. And that's what allows you to go on stage and embody the taboo and embody the thing that the general public doesn't, you know, doesn't get to experience. So I think my final question for you is just sort of, um, what do you see the way forward in the music industry as far as people who are experiencing mental distress? Um, we spoke with Chris earlier. He said there's there are a lot of changes happening. There are people being more aware. Um, but what do you think? How do you how do you see the way forward in um, as far as music industry and mental health? I think in terms of the music industry, I think we as an industry need to be more considerate of and work harder to provide mental health resources and access for, for people who need help. Um, I think mental health can be every bit as debilitating as, you know, a physical in injury and what musicians do and what people in the music industry do is very taxing physically, mentally, emotionally, um, but it's these emotions and these and these feelings and these experiences that this industry is built on. And so I think the industry needs to take care of its workers and, and take care of the people who are providing it the fuel, you know, it needs to continue. If there were no musicians, there would be no music and there would be no music industry. Um, so I think there just needs to be better care um, and more intention towards protecting people who have mental illness and uh and i think i mean i think there needs to be like a, a system of healthcare in the music industry i think therapy needs to be more normalized in the music industry i just think i think resources and access um are are the main thing that need to change in music well Mia, um, I just want to thank you so much for coming today and speaking to us it's been a really wonderful conversation it has yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.